This is one of the few places of unspoiled nature in the United Kingdom. An area with pockets of perfectly preserved terrain and teeming ecosystems. Where is this relic of a pre-factory age countryside? The answer is surprising. It's the military's tank firing range. In the south of England, in Dorset, the Lulworth Gunnery School is in fact one of the many military areas that are unintended sanctuaries for Britain's endangered species, such as this slow worm, for example. The silver-studded blue butterfly, or this smooth snake, all considered endangered or vulnerable in the UK today. Britain's Ministry of Defence owns some 240,000 hectares of training ground, land which hasn't been farmed on or built on for centuries. Though weapons of destruction are common, these tanks, machine guns and exploding shells at Lulworth haven't had a detrimental effect on the environment. And the animals, are relatively oblivious. This certainly hasn't gone unnoticed by the MOD. Major Mick Burgess and Colonel James Baker are two of the MOD employees dedicated to the conservation of defence estate land. Come on, butterfly. If you just look down there, that's amazing, right. That's a Lulworth skipper. And the last thing we want to Here at Lulworth, Range the, Officer Major the, Burgess there, is supported by the head of MOD Conservation, the, Colonel the, Baker, the, in looking the, after 2,989 hectares of nearly unspoiled nature reserve. Together, they must ensure that the training of the soldiers and the protection of the environment are both getting attention. You look down to the bottom there where the red flag is, right on the cliff edge. Finding the right balance is not always an easy task. To ensure the land is properly looked after, Major Burgess relies on a team of amateur and professional conservationists to keep their eye on Lulworth's land. I joined the Conservation Committee in 1994. Since that time I've been walking around and recording the different plant species and also recording the different vegetation types which are found on the ranges. Um, and it's such a fantastic area, such a diverse area, as you go from the, the coastal cliffs through to the, um, to the mires on the heathland. It's such a range of habitats, really have largely been untouched by modern agriculture. So, you know, you're in a little sort of um, time zone down in here. You know, it's, it is a, an amazing place. And every time I come down here, you sort of find new species. Smooth snake. For each of the rare species, I do a sketch map of where it occurs, what type of habitat it's growing in. It's just to keep a record of where it is and also to let MOD know where it's growing and so if they can do any, any management to, to encourage it. This is Limonium dodartiforme, a species of rock sea lavender, which is a very rare species globally, confined to the Dorset coast, where it grows on the cliff tops and the faces of the chalk cliffs. And then also there's another colony down on, on the Chesil Beach, but that, that's about it really, nowhere else in the world at all. This is bog hair grass, which is a, a nationally scarce species, confined to wet, acid soils on Heathland. Um, but it is, it is quite vulnerable being right next to the, um, to the tank run there, hence the, the fence post in the sign. This little patch here is probably 75% of the Dorset population, so it's uh, quite important. Since Brian began surveying at Lulworth, he has spent hundreds of hours cataloguing thousands of species. 
In many ways, I think an ecosystem, a woodland or a grass, and which has many different species of flowers and insects and birds and whatever, indicates a certain health of the, the planet itself. So if, if these things start dying out, then there is, there is something wrong. To prevent the destruction of wildlife and habitats in the UK, organisations such as WWF have dedicated themselves to fighting for them. The UK wildlife is facing a crisis. It's facing a crisis because the habitats where that wildlife lives is being destroyed. In recent times, we've destroyed 97% of rich wildlife grassland. We've destroyed 80% of heathland. If you destroy these habitats, the wildlife have got nowhere to go. And surprise, surprise, they start to die out. We lose species. Particularly if we're talking about sort of bird and insect species, I mean, there is a balance there. So if you take out a predator, then there will be an explosion of population of one, say, one particular insect, and that could eat particular plant species, so there'll be a knock-on effect. So if, you, if you're taking one part of the, um, the sort of the puzzle out, then you can upset a, a whole sort of ecosystem. According to WWF, 134 species of plants and animals have become extinct in the UK this century. 300 British government sites of special scientific interest are destroyed or damaged every year. Increasing prosperity and lifestyle changes have driven the urban sprawl. That's why a gunnery school can also be a refuge. How's your zoom? Lulworth is home to one of the most thriving populations of seeker and roe deer in the UK. Now, if you wanted to get a good shot of these, you can actually get in the back with the dogs. Major Terry Cooper is Lulworth's principal deer manager, something his army training has well prepared him for. We'll go for a walk now. If the wind's right and the sun's right, let's hope the deer are there. We're all MOD employees and we do this on a volunteer basis. We have uh, a group on this particular area looking after 600 plus deer. They all go through a, a training system. And at the end of that period, I can safely say that we've got very experienced semi-professional deer stalkers. This is a bit better for you. I think they've actually seen our cameraman. <laughs> okay, what you've got there is a small group of hinds and, and uh, stags just moving up. You know, it's so difficult to actually get near these herds at this time of the year because, of course, they've got small young with them. They like acid soils, um, they like the cover, they like the wet ground, and they can put up with vehicles and they can put up with gunfire, but uh, they, they don't like um, human disturbance, which now that group settled down, they're all feeding out there. They've had that little bit of human disturbance for the day. Um, but generally, you know, this, is, this is fantastic habitat for them. The farming methods nowadays, um, you know, there's hardly any ground that's that's left with an edible crop on it. Um, during the winter months, it's all it's all been ploughed up. Um, the metabolism of deer changes as well, and they need a different type of food. And I think once again, you know, we have it here. I think they need the rough grazing um, that we have here on the on the MOD ranges. This area is, is Sika country. This is downtown Sika land. They, they just love it here. Um, and, that's, and that's why we're kept so busy. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 34, 35, 36. Strange people that we are. We spend most of our lives sat out here under hedges, under trees like this, watching the sun go down. Not a bad life, I suppose. Not a bad hobby. MOD 
Dundee are a huge landowner, and really their species have survived more or less by accident, in a way. I mean, that's a great thing. They didn't intend to save all these things, but they have, you know, by owning such large areas and keeping the public out, um, keeping disturbance low, and not intensively farming their land. I mean, that's, that's been the key thing. The soldiers at Lulworth train nearly all year round. During training, the estate is marked as a danger area with red lights or flags to warn against the exploding shells and firing practices. Crucially, this means the public are kept away, although after hours, they do make one or two exceptions. Evelyn Prendergast is Lulworth's reigning odonatist, more commonly known as the Dragonfly Man. So we've got it this time. You see, that is a nationally scarce species, actually. A small red damselfly. And there's on, on his land like this. Weren't too lucky. First one you see is it. <laughs> a scarce one. And we'll see if we can find something blue to go with the red. Lulworth has an exceptional dragonfly population, but it wasn't always so. Military practices have not only made Lulworth a safe haven for these creatures, but they've often promoted the growth and survival of Lulworth's natural world through its own destructive practices. Heath fires, started by exploding shells, have brought unexpected benefits. Three years ago, four years ago, all that area you see there went up in, in flames one afternoon, and uh, it went quite out of control. But when they got their sort of fire engines out to try and put it out, they found there was absolutely no water at all. So with the range officer, we designed a new pond there, which is readily accessible to any fire engines coming along, where they can fill up their tanks if they have another fire. It also happens to be nice and sheltered, so dragonflies are probably appreciated too. Shall we go down and have a look at it? We made a total of 14 altogether, and they were made primarily by using some dangerous explosive which had to be blown up anyway. And the whole thing went bang and made these bigger pools down below. And they've been a great success as far as dragonflies are concerned, because it doesn't give you open water amongst all the acid bog where there's none before. Just purely coincidence. They are interesting uh, dragonflies. And uh, on some occasion when I come here, I may see 20 or 30 just flying around. And as I say, endangered, but quite common here. Thanks, we believe, largely to the work we've done on, the, on this land. Oh, you're looking at me, really, I'm looking at it. <laughs> this is what's known as the common blue damselfly. And it's very similar to the azure damselfly. The difference, main difference being that little, tiny little mark on the second segment there and the exact pattern down on this end. The, the, the blue is different than the other one. In fact, if you hold a damselfly like that by its wings, it doesn't do it any harm at all. On a good day, you, you might see uh, 50, 100 or more and just going around the ponds, either flying around by themselves, looking for mates, or actually uh, paired up together, or laying the eggs. Can you see that mating pair there? You see that she brings up her back end onto his chest, and so they mate like that with, in a circle. And then when they finish that, they often fly off together but uh, it takes two to do that.
this area has been put forward as a special area of conservation under the European Habitats Directive and also it's very, very wet. <laughs> um, really the, the key plant here is this bog moss. Um, it really acts as a sponge and sort of holds the water and then it supports all these wonderful things like carnivorous sundews there which has sort of a glue on the end of these hairs on the leaves and then the leaf curls up and the plant digests the, the insect to get more nutrients because basically it has to get other food to, to survive. Not a nice fate. In fact, that, that was the one we were looking for. That was the azure. Very sad. You sit on a lovely flower. And what does it do? It sucks your blood. You can't blame it. All the sundew was doing was doing what nature provided it, it for. The way it gets its food is just like that. So. In We haven't got any dragonfly lava, but we've got some newts and beetles. This is on the fun when you dig into a pond like that. You never know what you're going to get out. Now, if you've been looking for newts and beetles, we'll find lots of lava, I'm sure. I have another shot. Oh, that's still going good. Without falling in the pond. There it is, just on the edge. In amongst all the newts and everything, we found a, a dragonfly larva there. You can see him here, ugly looking brute. And you see that's the sort of thing that emerges from the water, climbs up onto a, a reed or something like that, splits along the back there, and slowly emerges out of the skin to become a beautiful damselfly, or dragonfly in this case. It's, it's quite a remarkable transformation. Can I go please now? <laughs> In England, we have a long history of amateur ecology, if, if you like, actually recording things, collecting things, and writing floras. Um, so there is a long history in, in this country, and I think it's, we have to pr preserve that, and we have to encourage our, our children and grandchildren to become interested so that we preserve all these, you know, um, beautiful plants and animals and habitats for the future. I think it is very, very important. On the east side of the range, Steve Hale and his wife Maureen look after Lulworth's colony of sand martins, who return each year after an exhausting flight from Africa. I've been ring on the ranges for, um, well, 95 I started. It takes about two or three years to get a, a license on your own. Um, a lot of, an awful lot of commitment. Uh, very unsocial hours, very early mornings, very late nights. The chap that trained me for ringer was my predecessor on the ranges, so when he retired, I jumped into his shoes. <laughs> and um, it's been very good. It's got better ever since. It's got better. I first started ringing because I got a little bit fed up with the, um, the way bird washing was going some years ago, with the sort of the twitching element to get long lists of rare birds. And I, I didn't really want to be associated with that. So um, I moved into more sort of local patchwork bird watching of, of your own little areas. And, uh, and the ringing side, it was a nice spin-off because it puts a scientific input on the birds you're looking at. So the work we're doing here is all helping hopefully to work out what's going wrong. Right. And uh, the ringers across the country with the other projects, all the data can be put together on a countrywide basis to see if there's any difference in southern latitudes to northern latitudes or, or what's going on. Just hang these up. It's a very exciting scheme. Maybe that they both got rings on. The main point of the study is to get birds coming back from the previous year. I've got birds here this year which are four or five years old, which is quite encouraging. And it's like finding an old friend turn up. That's what the study is all about. It's survival of adult birds rather than to keep on ringing new birds. We really go for the old birds. See if they make it back from Africa. This is another female. Blue patch. The males will develop a small brew patch, so you have to be a little careful, which is why I said it's got a good brew patch or a, or a small one, okay? Okay. Adult. It's an adult. 
Ring number P158303. The address is the British Museum, London SW7. The British Museum kindly allow their address to be used because it can fit on the ring and everybody knows of the British Museum in London. So it's quite a useful, useful address. Wing 107 millimetres. On the ranges, I only really do the San Martins now because uh, the emphasis on special studies and just random ringing. Fabulous birds, yeah. I enjoy the study by the San Martins more than anything else because they're small and pleasant and they don't bite. <laughs> they don't bite. No. The San Martin, it's not yet on the red list, but uh, the population has declined probably 52% last five or six years, so it's giving some concern. 14.2 grams. Ooh. Not quite our heaviest tonight, but... Okay, you can go there. Amazing little birds. The UK military is far from being alone. Throughout the world, training ranges double as wildlife sanctuaries, a sign of how badly civilians are doing in safeguarding nature. And so, organizations such as WWF are calling upon everyone to campaign for stronger wildlife protection. There is hope. It's still within our control. There is action we can take that will reverse, or at least stop, the decline. Uh, and it's, that's within our grasp, for people like WWF, to be getting the message out there that we can do better and let's learn from the tragic lessons of the past to ensure that we do provide a living countryside for our children and our grandchildren. I mean it sounds silly but in a way could you imagine a world without birdsong? or without trees, or without butterflies, or whatever. I mean, could you actually imagine it? I mean, I, th I think that's just, it's just as simple as that, to me. The irony is that amongst the deadliest weapons in a landscape of destruction, a kind of hope has been created. In the future, perhaps we can restore a living, working countryside. For now, Nature's army will continue to help defend Britain's wildlife.